I have a question for you all. Have you ever sat down and wondered, what does medical research look like? What are the life sciences that we hear about and we see the effects of every day actually look like? Or perhaps you may just be sitting there and thinking to yourself, why is this guy, a computer scientist and an engineer, standing here talking to me about the life sciences? So hopefully today I can answer at least one of those questions for you. But first, I'd like to tell you a story. So thanks to Hollywood, I used to be one of the rare few in research who could tell people what it was I did for a living, what my research was all about, without having to prepare an elevator speech, or give a TED talk for that matter. Um, that's because I worked in robotics. And thanks to my childhood heroes, R2-D2 and C-3PO, um, that's something that everyone feels like they understand and that they're somewhat invested in. I could tell people that my research involved teaching robots how to see, or how to walk, or how to make at least outwardly intelligent decisions, all in the very easily digestible context of a game of soccer. I could even stimulate some quite heated debate between sporting fans by bringing up this absurd notion of the Millennium Challenge, the idea that by 2050, a team of robots, not unlike these robots, will be able to defeat the FIFA World Cup champions at a soccer match. And people do that, they laugh, they look at me, they go, ha, you're a crazy long-haired freak, what are you on about? And that's until I show them this absolutely wonderful advancement in technology. Is it a wrong slide? No, the humble USB stick. But it's not the USB stick, it's what the USB stick symbolises. Okay. It symbolises accelerating growth, and it, it symbolises the wonder of technology. And what do I mean by this? If I have a USB stick today that's capacity one, whether it be one megabyte, one gigabyte, it doesn't matter, one, the next one will be two. But then it won't be three and four and five, it will be four and eight and 16, and each unit time, the capacity of my humble USB stick will double. Okay, accelerating growth. And if I stand here before you and proclaim to the world that within the next decade, we will be able to purchase a one terabyte USB stick, people aren't going to call me a madman, okay? They're not going to call me a visionary, a futurist. They'll be like, okay, that's fair enough, I can see that happening, okay? But it's not over the short term that accelerating growth is remarkable. It's when it's projected, uh, projected over decades rather than years. You start to see things like this, how man's first powered flight Okay, man's first power flight, just 66 years separated man's first powered flight from powered flight taking man to the moon. Okay, accelerating growth. And you may be sitting there thinking, all of this is great, that's wonderful, but what does any of this have to do with biology? What does this have to do with the life sciences? And this is really my take home message from the day. If you take nothing else away, at least from my talk, I want you to take home this message that is in the 21st century, health and medicine and biology and the life sciences in general are information technologies. They're information technologies. And as information technologies, we expect a few things. We expect that these things would also naturally follow these accelerating curves of growth. And that's exactly what we see. So a perfect example of this is a project called the Human Genome Project. Okay. In 1990, this ambitious project was launched. People said it would never happen. The idea that in a decade, give or take three years, um, we would be able to sequence the genome of one human one human. This project took 13 years, cost $3 billion. To this day, it's the largest collaborative biology project of all time. And in 2003, we had the genome of one human. We succeeded, okay? Where people said it was crazy, it wouldn't happen, we succeeded. In 2008, the Thousand Genome Project was launched. And in a third of the time, and less than 5% of the money, we had 1,000 human genomes sequenced. Earlier this year, the 100,000 Genome Project was launched accelerating growth in the life sciences. And all of this is great. We can generate terabytes upon terabytes of data, medical data, measure things at smaller and smaller resolutions by the day. But the problem is that no matter how deep we dig into this data, we look at it, nowhere in there does it tell us how to cure disease. It tells us nothing about humans. It tells us nothing about cancer. It doesn't tell us where drug targets are, what we can do, how we can change the world. It's just data. It's ones and zeros or TCs, A's and G's. It's just data. Okay. So the question is, how can we take this data? We can't just hand it to a biologist and say, tell me stuff, because it's terabytes of data. No one can look through that. They can't eyeball and be like, aha, there's a cure for cancer. It doesn't look like something you'd see under a microscope. What do we do with this? So you might say, well, I know what's going on. This guy's a computer scientist. Why don't we just hand it to computer scientists? 
computer scientists and statisticians and people that are used to dealing with these giant data sets, maybe they can say something. And you could do that. So one of my projects involves breast cancer. I could take my breast cancer data and I could give it to a computer scientist or a statistician and they would come back to me with something that looks like this. Okay? Can you make sense of this? No, but what this is commonly referred to in the industry, affectionately, I might add, is a hairball. Okay? <laughs> And what this hairball captures is it's a network where nodes are genes, so genes are the information carrying units in our genome. And we might say, okay, I want to know what genes are involved in breast cancer. So when one gene increases its activity, its expression, and another one seems to move around in the same way, we draw an edge between these genes and we say they're associated. If they go down together, we draw an edge between them, we say they're associated, and there we go, there's a result. We know some genes appear to be associated with one another. Okay, that's great. You can start to say something about that, but it doesn't take a PhD to identify that this is, this is restrictive. It's a very hard way to cure diseases. There's limitations to what we can do with this. Perhaps fun, most fundamental of all is the problem that this doesn't actually capture any biology. For all the biologists and medical researchers out there that have spent years of their life, millions of dollars doing biological research, this model throws it all away as unnecessary detail, doesn't use any of it at all. That's problematic. If you think about it, it's kind of similar to trying to work out why my computer all of a sudden is running slowly after looking at all of those dodgy websites by looking at this. Okay, you can take this metaphor quite a long way. So this is a computer or some sort of circuit. I can go, well, I can see there's components here. These components have pins. I can measure voltages on these tens of thousands of pins, see which ones go up and down together, draw something that looks like that. Now I can identify why my computer has a virus. Perhaps not. Perhaps a more sensible way, which is kind of common sense, is I could go and talk to someone who knows something about computers. And they could tell me, well, you know, some of those pins, some of those components form a CPU and others form RAM. And these things interact in a certain way. We have like a fetch execute cycle and memory management. And once you start to understand a computer as an aggregation of its systems rather than an aggregation of its components, then you can start to say interesting things about the computer. You can take the high level concepts that we care about, the software, my, why my software is and isn't running, and map it back onto these systems, these high level constructs. And if you take this metaphor and you extend it to the interrogation of biological data, you start to get a bit of a feel for what systems biology is all about. Okay? I wish I could go through all of these examples of the wonderful work that people in different labs do in systems biology. I don't have time. I encourage you all to do it. Go home and Google systems biology, computational biology, because a model of systems in biology may look something like this, or it might look like that or it might look like that. It doesn't matter, but the point is that today, this is what medical research is about. What I really want to change in your mind is perception. Is when you go home tonight and you're sitting down and you're thinking, I wonder what medical research looks like. I wonder where the labs are that all of these breakthroughs emerge from. You shouldn't be picturing something that looks like that. Okay? You should be picturing a lab that looks something like that. So, just in closing, earlier I gave you an example, uh, trying to convince you. I gave you an example of an, is something in the life sciences, okay, a product, a technology in the life sciences that's following an accelerating growth trend. That was my evidence, but we, your technology is technology. We can generate lots of stuff, measure lots of things, look at really small things, but what we care about are outcomes. We care about benefits. We care about tangible things like health, like life expectancy. So what I'd like to do in closing is just show you an example of where it's the outcomes of life sciences that are following accelerating growth trends that we would expect of an information technology. And this table, this table excites me. I like this table a lot. This is a table of human life expectancy over time. So beyond the revelation that in ancient Egypt I would have been a senior citizen, which is quite off-putting, you can see something here. What can you see? You can see that over about two and a half, three thousand years of development in society and technology and health and medicine, between ancient Egypt and the turn of the 20th century, human life expectancy improved by 20 years, give or take. In 100 years, less than 5% of the time, between the turn of the 20th and the 21st century, human life expectancy improved by 30 years. Depending on who you talk to today, Conservative estimates for what the life expectancy of every child born today range anywhere between 100 to 170 years. Okay. 
This stuff is real. And if you talk to some particularly optimistic and crazy mathematicians and scientists, they'll say, well, hang on, if over 100 years we improved our life expectancy by 30, and this keeps going up, aren't we soon going to reach a point where our life expectancy is improving quicker than we're aging? What's going to happen then? Okay. And I can see people looking at me being like, you long-haired freak, what are you talking about? This is crazy. You're living in the realm of fantasy. And to all of those people, I have just one thing to show you. Thank you.